Thanks everyone, good morning. Um, as Rav said, we're going through a period of unprecedented change, especially in the infrastructure and building space. Um, I work on a, a, a global team that um, one of the things that we do is look at innovation and we feed that innovation back into the products that we make. The other thing that we do is that we work on mega projects around the world, so we, we help try and help deliver those using our tools and we get a lot of feedback from um, some of the things probably that they don't do and so we, we as well feed that back in. But we're seeing a huge shift and a huge change in the way this is done. We're seeing massive disruption, not only um, in the way that we deliver and design and operate, but uh, the way that we just consume data and the way that we consume um, everything around us. And so this is really a discussion around that. And this is looking at very future technology. Some of this technology we know um, is going to make it, some of it may not. But it's really just a, a piece just to get everyone thinking about what we're thinking about from an Autodesk perspective. Before we kick off on the actual technology piece, I think it's important to understand what some of the trends are around the world. Um, and again, none of this would be um, a shock to anyone in terms of the meta trends that um, not only you'll see, but Autodesk will see. Things like you know, urbanisation, by 2050 there'll be 600 cities with over a million people in them. How do we not only deliver those, but how do we deal with the fact that we're going to put huge stresses on the existing infrastructure that we have? Um, rising standards of living, demand and energy consumption, um, most of the energy in the next 20 years, um, about 50% of the world's energy consumption will come from India and China. And so again, how do we, how do we try and deliver that energy? Because it's going to put huge stresses on the existing infrastructure, the existing energy infrastructure. So we need to look at more sustainable ways to generate energy. But the thing that we're going to look at today, and the piece we're going to look at, is innovation in technology. I wanted to just show this quote um, because I think it kind of sets the scene. One of the things that we are recognising is that we're being very conservative about what we're predicting with technology these days, and we look at things like Moore's Law, which basically says that every 18 months, two years, we sort of double in um, processing capacity or processing power. With the advent of cloud and other tools, that kind of disrupts that theory. So that theory has been pretty stable for about 30 years. Cloud and other technologies disrupt that. But I think that that's an interesting, um, an interesting quote. And one of the other things that we're seeing, and one of the other things that we definitely know, is that in the construction space, our productivity is decreasing. And that's a problem, because as Raf said, we need to deliver more and more infrastructure, and we need to do it faster than we've ever been able to do it before. On the flip side, some of the non-construction industries, such as manufacturing, have increased their productivity. Now, I don't want to draw too many parallels between the two industries, because um, with the manufacturing industry, if you think about a chair, they make a million of the chairs, they make a million of the same thing, but with infrastructure buildings, everything's, I guess, kind of bespoke. But again, we look at that, and I think that's a pretty interesting statistic as well. And just a quick quote again before we get into it on, um, I guess, technology, but not technology from an Autodesk perspective, but more of a technology um, to help them do things. So to help Arcadis um, visualise their, their work in a three dimension and give the ability to avoid design conflict. So it reduces risk. So using technology helps them reduce risk. That changes their business, it changes the way they pre-tender, it changes the way that they construct. So it's a huge disruption for not only the large uh, organisations like you know, Hyder Arcadis, but some of the small ones as well. So this presentation is broken up into uh, four key themes, the equipment, materials, monitoring and productivity. And I just wanted to show what's happening in each of these spaces and kind of break it up into those sub-segments, I guess. And so with the equipment piece, we're going to look at the efficiency, intelligence sensing, and robotics. So the first video, I think, sets the scene for the whole presentation. Uh, it's just a short Automated video. mining. Remotely monitored plants. Condition monitoring of stockpiles. Autonomous train loadout and automated haulage. A system controlled and monitored by people removed from mining conditions. People are crucial to the system, making decisions that ensure the mine runs safely and efficiently. The environment we're creating is where the machines do the repetitive task and people make the important decisions on behalf of the machines. What that allows us to do is take the operator out of the environment 
and put them into a safer environment. And the end outcome of that is that people have uh, safer, more productive and challenging roles within the mining environment. AHS, Autonomous Haulage System, is the first mine of the future technology to be put into full production. Autonomous trucks have travelled more than 1 million kilometres and will have carried more than 100 million tonnes of material since trials began in the Pilbara in December 2008. This new system breaks the traditional model of mining practices. It's revolutionary and introduces a completely different way of operating. And with it comes a range of new roles and opportunities in our business. The main difference in an AHS mine is that loads are hauled by autonomous trucks programmed to drive themselves. They navigate haul roads and intersections and move within the load, dump, stockpile and crusher areas. In this new mining environment, everyone entering the AHS area does so in an equipped manned vehicle. This ensures the autonomous trucks know where they are at all times. Central LB70 engine in passing. Confirmed LB70 is in actually in passing. Loader operators still have a vital role to play and they're in more control of their work environment. It's great because I can set one truck up, they'll back in, and then another <laughs> truck will come in and um, be waiting there. So as soon as I get rid of that truck, that other truck's in there very quick, it's very efficient. There will be new roles in an AHS mine that take people out of repetitive tasks and make them more responsible for the day-to-day decision-making in the mine. For example, this pit patroller spends much of his day in the mine and dump areas ensuring everything runs safely and efficiently. He manages truck routes and networks, refines dump locations and identifies ways to improve the AHS pit operation. I start my day by I go right around through the pit, making sure all the refines are in place and, and everything's okay for, for us to work. Ted, can you assign me to the 475 load location so I can re-refine it, mate? Thanks. And that box here, you can tell me ready, mate. Each AHS mine needs a number of roles managing the autonomous truck's movements. The people in these roles will help to determine the pit design and layout as well as the truck's speed and course. They will also determine where the trucks go and the number of tonnes moved by each truck. We work with the supervisor and the pit controller to manage the haul rigs and the dumping areas and we have to think in advance and be prepared for anything. We work in a digital environment. If you had told me eight or nine years ago that I was going to be doing this, I would not have believed you. I started off as an operator, grader operator, digger operator, worked my way up to now being a central controller. I love the challenge, I love the position, and I love where this has taken us. Yeah, Mark, I'll try and get them all in for you this time. Looks like we've got seven nodes here. This time it should work well. People are more stimulated in the AHS environment because they get to use a variety of different skills that you wouldn't use in conventional mining operations. Uh, anyone that's operated all trucks will tell you it can be quite tedious, repetitive, um, and it is quite challenging for the operators, especially on the night shifts. Using AHS has let us become more consistent, reliable, and above all else, safer. I used to be a truck driver for the manned operations and now I'm a central controller. Every day is a new day, it's a good challenge. I'm running the pit and I get the satisfaction from that. We're breaking new ground with AHS. This is the first key component of the mine of the future. And at Namaldi below water table, it will be the largest deployment of autonomous trucks in the world. As our fleet grows, we'll see productivity increase. And through automation, we're creating an environment where we will see additional significant business improvements. The AHS mine is a central part of the mine of the future. The deployment of 150 autonomous trucks in the Pilbara will see 50% of the Pilbara's production being moved this way. That's more than one and a half million tonnes per day. Introducing autonomous trucks into our operation revolutionises mining practices globally. It's a fundamental change to the way we mine. This step change is being driven by our people. 
making our minds safer and more productive. So, I think a lot of you may have heard of this autonomous mind that's going on with Rio, but many of you may not have seen it. So I think that just gives um, a good overview of um, the technology that we're seeing. And that encompasses a lot of the technology that you're going to see in this presentation. This idea that um, we need to be much more efficient through uh, autonomy and robotics. One of the key elements of, of, of having the mind of the future, and that's the Rio Tinto program, is this uh, idea of situational awareness. So each um, vehicle and each piece of plant knows where the other piece of plant is. It's a key component to delivering this. Um, and you know what we're seeing is don't think that that will be restricted to mining in the future. That will come into our space in roads and highways as well. Um, so the other thing that uh, we, we've seen oh, awesome. uh, improving fuel efficiency is uh, Cat have introduced the very first hybrid electric powertrain to one of their diggers. Now, Cat um, believes that that will save up to 20% per vehicle um, on the construction site. Um, with no degradation in power, they're actually seeing that the power that, um, that they, they need to actually use that digger is exactly the same with the hybrid electric. Again, this is a technology that we are definitely going to see more of. It's coming definitely in this space. We're going to, we go to see more efficiencies in, in the use of plant and the way that um, plant is used on site. <coughs> Let's look at uh, this idea of intelligent sensing. Um, one of the other technologies that we're seeing um, is a technology that improves safety. So if a work site is safe, then we know through statistical um, analysis that it's more productive. It's, it's a pretty simple equation. So what you're seeing here is this idea that each, again, each object knows where every other object is. So what's happening here is that worker is wearing a sensor on his body and that uh, piece of plant has a sensor inside it as well. If it becomes too close to that person, there are audible uh, alarms that go off and you see the red lights going off there. Now, he should not be there. I mean, that's silly. He shouldn't be walking around the back of uh, that machine. So this is a demonstration video. But this technology is extremely important because, again, that will drive safety. Safety drives efficiency and productivity. This is uh, what we're seeing in the automation space. So this is a technology I think we're going to see a, a whole lot more of. Now this again is a, I guess a bit of a proof of concept. The idea is that on uh, building construction sites, we need to be much more efficient about doing the mundane tasks on a, on a building construction site. So this is a robot that can do certain things. It, it can drill cores inside the slab, but most importantly, it can do the dreadfully menial task of laying out the internal block work or the internal stud walls. Uh, and even marking the electrical points and the plumbing points. Now, I spent a few years in industry, I spent nearly nine years in industry doing high rise construction. And I can tell you that this is horrible work. It takes a long time and it costs a lot of money. If we can automate this process, um, then this will help us, again, be more, product, more productive on the site. So these types of uh, menial tasks um, we're seeing in this space will become automated. And the other thing that we're seeing um, is the use of robotics. So this is a robotic brick lab. It can lay up to 1,500 bricks a day, as many as, I guess, three men on a, on a site. And again, the idea of this is that um, it's taking away that menial task. The robot is on a rail system, so it has um, sensor technology, so it knows where it's laid the last brick, and knows where it needs to lay the next brick. Uh, you can see that it's applying the mortar automatically. The other thing that it's doing with the mortar is that every single time it applies the mortar, it does it in a very uniform fashion. So what robots are really good at, as we all know, is doing one task the same many, many times, exactly the same. So that's extremely important. To take it to the next level, uh, when we had the Fukushima nuclear accident, one of the things that the US government wanted to do was run, run a, I guess, a, a competition um, to let everyone come in and, and show what they can do in terms of uh, robotic automation. So one of the things that happened with Fukushima is they couldn't actually get in there. Same with Chernobyl, but that was back in the 80s. So what you're seeing here is um, the robotic technology, one of the entrants in, the, in, this, tech, uh, in this competition for DARPA. The point of this is that the robots will do certain things in a very dangerous place where we don't want humans to go. 
clearly this technology will then feed into the construction space. This will not be limited to you know, dangerous situations. And one of the things I want you all to know is the actual agility of the robot, the way that it's quite nimble and it opens the door, it climbs the, the stairs, and it can actually do things on site as well. So it can cut a, ho a hole in that stud wall and push through. You can actually turn valves on and off. You can you know, pull out a fire hose. So this is, this, is, this is critical technology. Again, we're going to see this in the not too distant future on, on the building side and the construction side. Just wanted to touch on this um, <coughs> technology. Again, this really plays into this idea of situational awareness and automation. So this is basically an art installation. And what they wanted to do with this was to understand how they could do um, the idea of picking objects up and laying them out in a uniform manner. This happened over a period of about a day. One of the important aspects of this is that the mini drones know where the other mini drones are. They're all controlled to do a certain thing. And they all did that very, very well. You can see that they laid that, they laid those bricks uh, and they actually constructed that object um, very, very well. One of the stats that we look at is this idea of machine control as well. So I think everyone's familiar with um, this idea that we let the machines be controlled by a digital model. Um, and less user input on that. So the digital model is really at the core of the data, is at the core of the construction site. Um, back in 2013, um, US Federal Highway uh, cited a report that would save up like 50% operational savings using automatic machine guidance control. And then what we're seeing then is industry picking up on that and CAT saying, well, we're going to, um, I guess, patent a fully autonomous excavation of the system. So industry, in industry is certainly listening, governments definitely listening to this and again a key component. So let's look a little bit at the material space and this idea of prefabrication. Now there are huge efficiencies in, in prefabrication if we can fabricate objects off site and simply bring them in and place them like Lego um, essentially that drives efficiency. What you're seeing here is a 30 story building in China built in 30 days. Uh, you can see the time down the bottom here. Now, what you probably don't see in the background is the two years of planning that went into this. So, uh, I guess this is this is really really great. Um, you can see that it's you know magnitude nine earthquake resistant. Uh, it's it's um, built in a very sustainable way. You see here it's four times more energy efficient. They use fifteen centimeter per mole insulation, so um, you know it captures the heat. Um, it captures that energy efficiency, I guess, and using external solar shading. But this is going to be, going to have to be, some of the technology that we must use to deliver this in the future. And this one will not, again, be restricted to the building space. This will then, the prefabrication will come to other areas of construction as well. And so I'll let it go, but essentially, they did it. They actually did it right on time and they delivered it. It's a hotel in China. But again, very, very interesting uh, and a very good, uh, example of what can be done today, not tomorrow, in the prefabrication space. Wanted to just touch on this as well. Um, this is um, one of our partners in the Netherlands, Caymans, a huge engineering company, um, have looked very closely at how they can deliver different types of um, infrastructure on roads and highways. So they've introduced this idea of dynamic paint. So as it gets colder, the paint shows up as frost. Um, inducted charging lanes for electric vehicles, so you don't need to stop off at a supercharged station with your Tesla as you drive it charges. Interactive lights, so why do we need lights on when there's no cars on a highway, essentially, on a major highway, so trying to save energy that way. Um, intelligent roads that understand the type of vehicles that are driving on it and can change the, the line marking to suit. And then this idea of capturing some of that energy that happens on a roads and highway, um, and on a day-to-day -day in a roads and highway. So what happens is that um, they have understood that when you come out of a tunnel, there's a lot of wind that actually gets lost from, from vehicles. So what they've done is that they've put these little fans out um, to capture some of that energy and then feed that energy back into the road network. So again, we're, we're, we're going to need this if we're going to power some of these uh, infrastructure projects of the future. Um, it's no secret that we are uh, very heavily involved in 3D printing. In fact, we've committed $100 million last year into a 3D printing fund. 
3D printing for a long time, um, the experience, I guess, hasn't been that great. You know, printing, uh, uh, printing Yoda, Yoda in little plastic white Yoda. You know, that that really doesn't serve much purpose other than isn't it great that we now have this type of technology? The reason that we've created this fund, that Autodesk has created the Spark Fund, is that we want to bring this technology forward uh, rapidly because. If we can do this on a grand scale, then again, that feeds into this idea of efficiency through prefabrication. What you're actually seeing here is the 3D printing of a jet engine um, and the 3D printing of metal. So again, the, the theme here is that if we can start printing um, more, um, I guess, solid objects like metal, then we can start doing other things with 3D printing. Uh, and it actually worked. This is the world's first 3D printed car. Not a vehicle that I would want to be in. But again, you know, I think this is an interesting uh, video because it shows what uh, people are thinking about. They're thinking about fabricating objects like a car. Um, and again, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we know is that 30% of all manufacturing globally um, goes into the construction space. So, you know, it's, it's not always about cars and TVs and tables. 30% of everything goes into this. One. So, yeah, I just wanted to show this because I think it's pretty interesting. Um, and one of the things that we know as well is that companies like Google and Volvo and Audi are all developing driverless technology and it's very, very advanced. They're coming a long way. We need um, more intelligent infrastructure to be able to facilitate the use of these driverless cars. They're great on roads and highways, and I think the example that Audi did at the start of this year was they drove a, an A6 from uh, San Francisco to Las Vegas. Probably what you didn't see was that the majority of that was driverless on the, on the highway between uh, San Fran and Vegas, which is, which is very good, but we need better infrastructure, uh, more intelligent infrastructure if we're going to have that type of technology. This is, again, um, I guess it was started out as a, a, a proof, proof of concept and this technology is called contour crafting. So this idea that you would develop a system that would 3D print a much larger object, for example a house or a building. Um, the idea of this is that it's on a, a rail and boom system. The model is hosted inside obviously the, uh, the rail and boom system. And literally this, um, I guess this proof of concept just goes through and contour crafts the building each individual wall. It takes a reasonable amount of time to do. Um, but again, this is being thought about. But not only thought about, this is actually now being put into practice. So that was more of an animation. This is it in reality. And then in 2014, we know that uh, there were 10 houses 3D printed in 24 hours for four and a half thousand dollars each. What's important about that is that if we're going to talk about sustainable living and giving access to houses to people in the world that don't have houses, this is a huge technology. It's cheap, efficient uh, and fast technology. So let's move on to monitoring. We're going to look at all of those three aspects to the monitoring space. So one of the things that we know and one of the things that I know from personal experience is that um, designers do a very, very good job at using not only our tools but all tools to design buildings and infrastructure. And they create these lovely 3D models, intelligent 3D models. What happens is when it comes to the field to actually you know, put shovels in the dirt and put pins on the slab, that information and intelligence is lost. As a surveyor, they sit there with a series of plans and then have to be calculated for two weeks and try and work out and try and recreate those internal walls. What we've said as a business is that that doesn't make sense to us, that's inefficient. We actually want to leverage the intelligence and the geometry of that model in the field. So we have a technology called um, BIM360 Layout in which the surveyor now uses a tablet as their field controller and they go out to the field with the model on their tablet and they can set and lay out any object inside that model that they need to. What's great about that is, um, if you think about it, um, Holistically, I don't have to walk back to the site if someone asks me to set out something in the mechanical space. I've got it there in the model. If I need to set out the curve model, the set downs in the slab, the edge of slab, if I need to as build some of the penetrations, I can do that. I know that. The great thing about this technology as well is that that as build information automatically gets fed back into the designer's model and they see straight away 
if something's not right. They see the delta between what we design and what is actually being laid in on the site. In theory, there should be no mistakes if you're using this, but we know that there are. So um, we're going to see more in this space. This is this is just the first of this piece of technology. Um, yeah, again, we don't want um, the mundane process of calculating offsets to grids and missing dimensions and not being there, you've got to ring the architect, what's the dimension between the offset between grid A and the edge of that slab because they've missed the dimension, it's not their fault, it's just the way that it works. If I have the model, I know the model's right, I don't need to ask those questions and just do it with people.